So let's talk about DNA sequencing and profiling. Here's the syllabus objectives. We need to be able to recognize the application of DNA sequencing to map species genomes and also DNA profiling to identify unique genetic information. We also need to explain the purpose of PCR and gel electrophoresis. So let's get into it. DNA profiling first. So all individuals have unique nucleotide sequences in their genome, of course, except for identical twins that have an identical genome. So we often call this the genetic fingerprint because everybody is individual. So we can compare the sequences of nucleotides as an effective way of establishing identity. And that can be used in a whole range of different ways in which we can talk about in a little while. So DNA profiling is a technique that we can use to be able to compare individuals' uh, DNA sequences without actually having to use the whole of the genome. What it comes down to is that is this concept called RFLP, Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism. Looks like a lot here, but restriction, we're talking about using a restriction enzyme to chop it up. Fragment, we're talking about a fragment of DNA, the length of the fragment of DNA, and poly means many. And, and so morph means form. So different forms or many different forms. Okay, so, so there's variation between individuals in the number of single nucleotide repeats in their introns. Remember, the introns are the part of the, the non-coding part of a, a gene. And there's variation between individuals in terms of the number of single nucleotide repeats. So we can use a restriction enzyme to cut fragments of the DNA at specific sites and different individuals are going to have different lengths of these fragments because of the difference in the number of single nucleotide repeats. You can see here that we've got a different number of single nucleotide repeats, so we've got a different length fragment of the same section of DNA. So we can put that through electrophoresis and that's going to separate it based on size. So let's have a look at electrophoresis. We call it gel electrophoresis. This is the machine here, it's really portable. You know, schools have gel electrophoresis machines. Um, and it's, it's got this agarose gel. And you can see that up one end of it, we have these things called wells. And it's in these wells that we use a micro pipette to, um, to insert the, the DNA in solution. This is the negative terminal and this is the positive terminal. So as you can see, the the wells are on the negative side. DNA has a negative charge. So when the charge is passed through the gel, it's going to drag the DNA out towards the positive. Now, this is where the size comes in. The smaller the DNA fragments, the further it's going to travel through the agarose gel because it moves faster because it's smaller. So that's going to separate the um, the, the segments of DNA based on size. So we end up with these bands of DNA and then we can use that to make a comparison. So we use a restriction enzyme to cut the DNA into fragments that vary between individuals based on the number of SNRs, which is the number of single nucleotide repeats. DNA is negatively charged, so it's drawn to the positive side of the gel. Smaller DNA fragments travel further we're able to visualize the DNA as bands. Now, so we're able to use this for a number of different applications. For example, paternity testing. So when there's debate over who the father is of a child, we can use gel electrophoresis. We can also use it for forensics to locate a suspect at um, the site of a crime. We can also use it in ecological studies, for example, doing a capture release might use it to to see if how closely related two organisms of the same species are. Um, so here's an example here of how we might want to use it for a paternity test. Here's the mother's DNA. Here's the child's DNA. Every fragment of DNA um, here from the child needs to either come from the mother or the father. So we've just 
conveniently uh, colored the ones from mum in this orange color. So we need to try and match up who has got, uh, who this child got the yellow bands from. And we can see the best match is this person here. So you can see that there's two matches for, for um, parent two or dad two. There's two matches for dad three, but there's one, two, three, four matches for dad one. So from a probability point of view, we would say that dad one is the father. Another genetic technology that's used widely is PCR or polymerase chain reaction. So we use this on our sample of DNA, perhaps from a crime scene or a sample from a potential parent to amplify the amount of DNA that we have prior to doing electrophoresis. So PCR is polymerase chain reaction. We know that a polymerase, like DNA polymerase, is the enzyme that's involved in, in constructing DNA strands. And you'll see in a moment why we call it a chain reaction. Um, and so it, it's a technique used to amplify DNA, increase or produce a large amount of DNA. So for that to occur, we need some basic building blocks. We need polymerase, we need primers to start the process of elongation, and we also need free nucleotides. Now, the polymerase actually comes from a bacterium. We call it TAC polymerase. It's from Thermus aquaticus bacterium. So it's TAC polymerase. So we basically throw all of this into um, an Eppendorf tube and put it into a PCR machine, which you can see it's portable. It's on a, um, a desktop in a lab. And what that does is actually has different temperatures for each stage of the, the PCR chain reaction. So, um, so that, that's essentially what it does, is it, it changes the temperature. So let's have a look at the steps of PCR. So there's three steps. Firstly, denaturation, uh, and we, we, we're familiar with denaturation in terms of changing proteins. Denaturation is, um, happens, is the first step that's involved in actually splitting the DNA strands. The next process is annealing, which is actually just attaching the primer. And then the next step is the elongation, which we know the process of elongation for DNA, that's when DNA polymerase is inserting or adding the nucleotides. So, um, so why is it called a chain reaction? Well, um, so we've gone through this process once, and so now we've got um, two double strands of DNA, semi-conservative, and then the process is going to be repeated. So we're going to go through denaturation, annealing, and elongation, and then it's going to be repeated again and again and again. So it's it's exponential growth, if you like, and we're going to double the amount of DNA after every cycle. So that's PCR, and you would have heard of PCR um, associated with, with COVID-19. And essentially what that was, was just taking a sample, amplifying it, and then using it to try and identify whether somebody uh, had the coronavirus. PCR is also used in DNA sequencing, which we're gonna look at in a moment. So there's loads of different applications of polymerase chain reaction. So that brings us to DNA sequencing. This is the process of working out the sequence of nucleotides in a genome. The Human Genome Project, it took about 20 years and, and it cost billions of dollars. So 20 years to sequence the human genome. Now, the good news is that now we've got new technologies, next generation sequencing, and the third generation sequencing that have made the process so much quicker, so much more affordable and so much more portable as well, which has just opened up tremendous opportunities for, for future. So we're going to look at this first uh, approach that they use, which is the Sanger sequencing, which they use in the Human Genome Project. So this is deoxy, uh, this, is, this is a normal deoxyribose nucleotide. And you can see that on carbon three, one, two, three, we've got a hydroxide group. Now, we have another variation called dideoxynucleotide, and as you can see, 
there's a hydrogen but no hydroxide at carbon 3. Remember how the next nucleotide joins on to the carbon 3 of, our, of this nucleotide? Well, it's unable to do so when we just have the hydrogen, not the hydroxide. So this is what we call a chain termination nucleotide. In DNA replication or elongation, when we get one of these dideoxynucleotides and insert that in, into the fragment of DNA that's being elongated, well, it's actually going to terminate the elongation process. So it's, that's what's used to be able to identify what the, last, uh, what the last nucleotide is on that segment of DNA. So the way they do that is, again, into our ampule, we throw primers, templates, uh, the, sorry, the DNA template strand, and also these, um, so, so this one here, this is just normal free nucleotides, and as well as that, these dideoxynucleotides. Now, can you see TCAG? So some of each, but each of them has been dyed a different color so that when it's terminated with a dideoxynucleotide that's uh, a T, well, we know that that's red. Or rather, if we know that it's red, we know that it's a T. And if it's blue, we know it's C, etc. So we have segments of all sorts of different lengths and we have different colors to tell us what the last nucleotide was. We then pass that through an electrophoresis, a specific type called a capillary gel electrophoresis, but it works the same way. The smaller particles travel further, the largest particles travel the shortest distance. And so we're able to identify the specific sequence based on this color. So we pass it through a computer and it comes up with this graph here where we've got the, um, the peaks of different colors indicating what the sequence is. So you can see here, if you follow through these colors, we've got a G, G, T, C, A, etc. So that is Sanger sequencing. Now, because the genome, the human genome is absolutely massive, that actually took 20 years to do that. Now, so here, here's a summary of what, um, what I just described in that Sanger sequencing process. So now we've got next generation and third generation sequencing. Much faster, more widely available. And so it can actually be used diagnostically now. So individual patients' DNA can be sequenced. So doctors are able to identify what specific mutations this individual patient with cancer or other diseases has. And they can provide personalized treatment for that individual based on their specific genetics. So this opens up huge opportunities for the future in terms of careers. And, and one area is called bioinformatics. Now, it, it, it's at the junction between biology, mathematics, or specifically statistics, and computer science. So it's, it's a huge area. It's going to be very much in demand in the future, managing huge amounts of data, collecting and analyzing data, for both clinical and research purposes. And, um, and our syllabus actually talks about a particular system called BLAST that you might want to look at. Um, and BLAST is called the Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. Huge database that can be used for research purposes to, and, um, to compare, compare genomic and also protein sequences as well between different species. The, the ease in which we're able to um, sequence DNA now and this ever-increasing library of, um, of data that we've got uh, opens up so many areas for research um, and uh, clinical use in the future. And at the forefront of that is careers in bioinformatics. So, so that's a bit more biotechnology, and this is what the syllabus objectives were and also the guidance.